Hello, New Life. So for those of you who don't know, my name is David, and I'm on staff uh, here at New Life. And Jonathan, who is down in San Diego this week, asked me to fill in for him uh, preaching this Sunday, uh, continuing in our series called Doing Life with Jesus. So far, Jonathan has taken us in this series through Jesus's growing up years. Um, he showed us how Jesus was a faithful attendee at his local synagogue in Nazareth, uh, how Jesus began to build relationships with his disciples, and now we have come to Luke chapter 6, which is Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. That's that, that beautiful picture uh, that you have there before you, uh, painted by uh, James Tissot, a wonderful artist, and he's depicting the Sermon on the Mount, which is contained in Matthew in chapters 5, 6, and 7, so quite a lot of material, three chapters worth, and in Luke, it's, it's just contained in a single chapter, but even still, that's far too much ground to cover in a single sermon uh, for you this morning, so my goal is a little bit more modest than that. I hope this morning to simply give you enough of an introduction to the Sermon on the Mount that, that you can kind of take the tools that you learned this morning and, and, and run with them uh, to help you see how, how this, this chapter and, and this sermon that Jesus preached up in Galilee, um, how it fits in, in the bigger picture within the Gospels and within the life of Jesus. So in order to do that, let me share with you a, a bit of the structure of the Sermon on the Mount in Luke's Gospel. Um, its introduction uh, has blessings and woes, what we call the Beatitudes, a section on loving your enemies, something which I'll, I'm calling the anti-Pharisee polemic. Then finally, its conclusion is uh, that wonderful parable about building one's house on the rock. So this morning, I thought in order to give you the, the tools to understand the sermon in its entirety, I would be best served looking just at the introduction to the sermon, the, the Beatitudes, and its conclusion, that, that final uh, parable. But um, instead of taking them in that order, I'm going to switch it around a little bit, flip the script, and look first at the conclusion, Jesus' conclusion to his sermon on the Mount, that parable about building one's house on the rock. And then finally, we'll, we'll take a look at the introduction after that. So in order to do that, I'm going to get a little bit of help from this fancy dancy imitation whiteboard. Um, this is a little document camera. I'm going to focus it a little bit. There we are. This is going to help me um, kind of explain and, and walk through some of the details of the Sermon on the Mount. I, I hope it works out for you. I hope, it, I, hope it's, uh, I hope it's clear and I hope it's helpful. So a little bit of a background and an introduction to the Sermon on the, on the Mount, which will help us build up towards this, this, uh, this conclusion here, um, Jesus' conclusion, uh, the call to build uh, one's house on the rock. So a couple things you need to know, two things um, by way of introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. One, I'm uh, just setting up the, the context, what has happened before this point in the story. One, Jesus has become a wildly popular, can you read that? He's become a wildly popular folk hero. He spent a year in Judea gathering all of John's disciples to himself, and now he's gone on a six-month preaching tour throughout all of Galilee, and he's just saturating the land with his message and his miracles, and the crowds are showing up in mass. So that is important for us to realize, and we'll understand a little bit more why later. And then secondly, another thing that we've got to grapple with is not only is Jesus wildly popular, at this point, um, beginning his message, but he's also surprisingly confrontational. You guys are going to have to uh, wrestle with my poor handwriting this morning. I, I hope you uh, can cope with that. He's surprisingly confrontational. Now, have you ever asked why Jesus is so confrontational? I mean, it kind of it can rub you the wrong way sometimes, can't it? When um, he's calling uh, the Pharisees a brood of vipers and he's saying, Man, woe on you, woe to you. That, that's pretty intense. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of helped in my understanding of Jesus's, um, I don't know, almost, almost aggression in, in certain 
uh, instances of his of his ministry, I'm helped by a passage in Ezekiel, um, in Ezekiel 34, which talks about the shepherds of Israel. Now, the shepherds of Israel are those who have um, spiritual authority over the people of Israel. They are the, the religious leaders. And look how Ezekiel describes these leaders. Um, Son of man, God says to Ezekiel, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy, say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves? Should not the shepherds rather be feeding the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. Now, the shepherds' responsibility is to feed the sheep, but what are they doing instead? Well, the weak, they have not strengthened. The sick, you have not healed. The injured, you have not bound up. The strayed, you have not brought back. The lost, you have not sought. And with force, and with harshness, you have ruled over them. So who, who are these shepherds that Jesus is calling out? Well, they are two groups, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They are the villains in this story. They are the false shepherds who are not healing the sick, who are, who are simply feeding themselves and not feeding the sheep. And, and Jesus' confrontation with this group is, is not a negative thing. It's a very much a positive thing. Look down at, at verse 10. Behold, Jesus says, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my sheep at their hand. They're not going to be shepherds over my sheep anymore. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths, that they may no longer be food for them. So Jesus' is, um, confrontation with, with these two groups, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, it, it's really it's a rescue mission. He's rescuing the people of Israel from their um, incompetent and, and selfish and self-serving leaders. So he's going to do that. He, he's going to confront each of these groups first. He's going to confront the Sadducees, and then second, he's going to confront the Pharisees. Now, in his first year, Jesus' first year of his ministry, right after he's baptized, he spends a year in Judea, and John 2 tells us during that time, he, he cleanses the temple for the first time, and I'm, I'm doing this with my hands to tell you that he goes into the temple, and he overturns the money changers' tables, and he makes a, a whip out of cords, and he, he whips um, those who would sell um, sheep and doves to the Jews who come in at outrageous prices, totally taking advantage of the sheep. So he does that first. And then second, after he moves his ministry from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north, he begins to target the Pharisees, um, another group of, of false shepherds taking advantage of the sheep. And he does so both, um, both through actions, make a note of that, both through his actions and also through his words. And you can remember um, <laughs> a series of Jesus's actions through which he confronts the Pharisees. You remember how he, uh, all of his activity on the Sabbath, right? How he's healing people on the Sabbath, left and right. And he's breaking the, the rules that the Pharisees have set for what, what a Sabbath should look like, false rules. Um, his disciples are plucking grain on the Sabbath. And Jesus says the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Um, we remember as well that Jesus during this time is uh, going and he's eating with sinners, right? Sinners and tax collectors. And the Pharisees, um, <laughs> they don't like that at all. But what does Jesus say in response to that? He says that the healthy have no need of a physician. Remember that line? The healthy have no need of, of a physician, um, but the sick do. And remember that line from Ezekiel we just read? <clears throat> what should the shepherds do? The shepherds should heal the sick. And Jesus says that the, the, the healthy have no need of, of, a, <clears throat> um, of a physician, but the sick do. And I'm, I'm here to be that physician for them. The, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost, which just runs right up against the, the Pharisees' um, kind of modus operandi. But Jesus is also going to confront the Pharisees through his words. And that is done primarily in the Sermon on the Mount, S-O-T-M, the Sermon on the Mount. And one of my favorite 
scholars on the life of Christ is a guy named Doug Bookman. This guy's really cool. He, he speaks at a mile a minute. I like him. Doug Bookman. And he says that, that the key to understanding the Sermon on the Mount, the key to understanding it is to imagine Jesus pointing. Imagine Jesus is pointing. In this case, he's pointing at the Pharisees. So take a look at how, I'm just going to do a quick overview of the Sermon on the Mount and see how each piece is really a, a, a polemic directed against the Pharisees. So take a look at this. So what does Jesus do in the Sermon on the Mount? He rejects the Pharisees a couple things. He rejects the Pharisees. One, he's going to reject their interpretation of the law. And he's going to do that in Matthew 5. And then also, secondly, he's going to reject the Pharisees' practice. Practice of the law. And this is in Matthew 6. Now, let me remind you um, how he does each of these things. We studied Matthew uh, a couple years ago as a church. And you remember in Matthew 5, there's a series of statements in which Jesus says, You have heard that it was said, but I say to you. Now, now remember, remember our, our, our little clue. We're supposed to imagine Jesus pointing. You have heard that it was said by these guys, the Pharisees. They say this. You have heard that it was said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, anyone who is angry is, is, is guilty of the law. You shall not commit adultery, pointing at the Pharisees. Um, no, anyone who, who lusts after the woman is, is, is guilty against the law. So what, what Jesus is doing here, he's, he's rejecting the external conformity interpretation of the law, which the Pharisees are experts at. They're great at external conformity. That's their thing. It's their, their, their jam. But Jesus is saying that the law's true intent the true intent of the law is to, is to create or point us towards true heart obedience. That's what he's saying. He's, he's um, taking up a notch a little bit, I guess you could say. Now, second, Jesus is going to reject the Pharisees' practice of the law. And there, there are, are three little elements that Jesus <clears throat> um, lists here in Matthew 6. Three things. Um, Prayer, and these, these are spiritual disciplines, prayer, um, giving of alms, and fasting. And each of these spiritual disciplines, prayer, giving, and fasting, the Pharisees practice all of them, but they do so, it says explicitly, in order to be seen by man. That's the whole and only reason why they, they practice those disciplines, and Jesus, Jesus rejects that. So this is, is what I would call the, I'm going to make that a big... Here we go. This is the body of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, Jesus next, in the conclusion, is going to drive his listeners to a choice. I'm going to make this in big caps. All caps. Drive his listeners to a choice. And he does this um, with a couple of, of powerful illustrations. Let's take a look at those in Matthew 7. This is Jesus's conclusion, Matthew 7, 13, I think it is. <clears throat> so you have this choice. You, you have a choice between two options here at, at the end of Jesus's sermon. You can enter by the narrow gate. Um, that gate is wide. The way is easy, but unfortunately it leads to destruction. And what he's doing, remember, we're, we're, we're pointing here in the Sermon on the Mount, and he's pointing at the Pharisees. You see there, their legalistic, self-righteous, man-centered religion, that, that is the wide gate, that is the easy way, and that leads to destruction. But then Jesus is saying, or you could go through the narrow way um, and the narrow gate that leads to life, and that is following me and my word. So this choice, it's a choice between, yeah, you can see that almost, the broad way and the narrow way. Um, let me make this like and move my face. Look at this fantastic technology we have. Between the broad way and the narrow way, it's also a choice. And now we're finally getting to uh, the conclusion, which I promised earlier. It's a choice to build your house either on sand or what? Or you could build on the rock. And again, Jesus is pointing to the Pharisees. You want to build your house on the sand? follow their 
uh, man-centered religion, go for it. But look what it's going to lead to. We're going to jump down to verse 24. <clears throat> Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. And yet everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them, winking at the Pharisees, that person will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the floods came, the wind blew against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. So that is the conclusion. I'm going to say that, that that's the conclusion of Jesus's sermon. And you see how each of these pieces, it's, it's directed against the Pharisees, but then it also provides an alternative. Um, <laughs> you can follow the way of the Pharisees, but then you could follow me as well and, and have the correct interpretation of the, the law and, and the you know, good, right, and holy practice of the spiritual disciplines. You can follow the way that leads into life. But now let's take a look. We looked at the body and the conclusion. Let's take a look at the introduction. I'm going to jump back to this. We, we, we looked at the conclusion. Now let's take a look at that introduction, the, the blessings and the woes. And I'm going to give you a new piece of paper. It's about time for that, don't you think? Blessings and the woes. This is G how Jesus introduces his Sermon on the Mount. Um, they're typically called Beatitudes, right? We, we, we know them by the name Beatitude, and that comes from the Gospel of, uh, of Matthew predominantly. Because what's interesting about these, these lists is how Matthew differs from Luke. But let's, let's take a look first at at the Beatitudes as they're found in Luke. And let's look through them in, in the New Living. <clears throat> then Jesus turned to his disciples and said, God blesses you who are poor. God blesses you who are poor, for the kingdom of God is yours. God blesses you who are hungry now. And this temporal reference um, to being hungry now is, is important. We'll, we'll, we'll pay attention to that. Hungry now, for you will be future. You will be satisfied. God blesses you who weep now, for in due time you will laugh. What blessings await you when people hate you and exclude you and mock you and curse you as evil because you follow the Son of Man? When that happens, be happy. Yes, leap for joy, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, their ancestor treated the ancient prophets the same way. Now, the NLT translates this word, what sorrow awaits, and uh, the ESV, Luke 6, 24, the ESV is going to use the word woe. Most translations go with woe. But let's read the New Living. What sorrow awaits you who are rich, for you have only your happiness now, in this reference to, to the present. What sorrow awaits you who are fat and prosperous now, for a time of awful hunger awaits you. What sorrow awaits you who laugh now, for your laughing will turn into mourning and sorrow. Finally, what sorrow awaits you who are praised by the crowds, for their ancestors also praised the false prophets. We have here in Luke 6, 20 to 26, four blessings and four woes. So let's take a look at how these differ from the Beatitudes in Matthew. So what's interesting is a couple things. We'll, we'll make note of a couple things. First, in Luke, we have both blessings and woes. That's kind of interesting. Um, in Matthew, we have eight blessings or eight beatitudes and zero woes. And in Luke, we have four of each. Another thing that's interesting, um, and you probably noticed this when I read the beatitudes a minute ago, you're probably more familiar with the Matthew version, which says, blessed are the poor. How, can you finish that for me? Blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. But Luke, Luke excludes that last bit. We'll go back up to it. He only says, blessed are the poor. And then also, you probably remember the version in Matthew that says, 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, right? But Luke only says, blessed are you who are hungry. He, I think, very intentionally um, wants to focus on the kind of socioeconomic elements um, of, of the blessings and not, and, and not bring in the spiritual ones. Although I think both apply, and certainly they do, because this is a, this is a single sermon. Luke is going to focus on the physical. And, and why does he do that? He's doing that, in my opinion, um, from what study I've done, because he wants to emphasize that choice, right? He wants to emphasize that choice between following the Pharisees, listening to them, or listening to Jesus. Remember, we've, we've looked at that, that choice already, um, how Jesus concludes his sermon with that choice. Are you going to follow um, the Pharisees or are you going to follow me? And now I think in the Beatitudes as well, Jesus, or I guess Luke focuses Jesus' words on the physical in order to highlight this um, highlight this choice between the Pharisees and Jesus, specifically because when you choose Jesus over the Pharisees, when you reject the Pharisees and choose Jesus, it's going to lead to physical consequences. It's going to lead to consequences. Um, consequences which are going to look a little bit like this column right here, poverty, hunger, mourning, and persecution. And specifically in Jesus's day, and now, now this column is going to look different for every generation of the church, for our generation, for the, the generation of the apostles, and for Jesus's day. But in Jesus's day, this looked like being put out of the synagogue. Being put out of the synagogue. That was a big deal. Now, let, let me t show you a couple of passages to demonstrate this. Make this a little bit bigger. So you remember um, in John 9, there's the guy who was born blind and Jesus healed him. He can see. And this causes a whole bunch of confusion and difficulty and um, frustration from the Pharisees. And, and they try to explain this miracle away. And they go to his parents, the, the, the formerly blind man's parents. And they're like, how is this guy seeing? And look how his parents respond. It's super interesting. They say, we know that we know this is our son and we know that he was born blind, but how he sees now, we don't, we do not know. Like, don't ask me, ask him. He's of age. He will speak to himself. Isn't that a strange reaction? You know, wouldn't you think these parents um, will be leaping for joy? Here, my son, he's been blind his whole life, and now he can see. Hallelujah. Who, who healed this guy? Well, that's this guy, Jesus. It's amazing. Why didn't the parents respond that way? It says that his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone would confess Jesus to be the Christ, well, that person was to be put out of the synagogue. And this blind man's parents were so afraid of being put out of the synagogue that they would even almost kind of like disown their own son after his healing. It's really quite tragic. You see this again in John 12. Nevertheless, many of the authorities believed in Jesus. It's great. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess that belief because they didn't want to be put out of the synagogue. And finally, Jesus is going to warn his disciples as well. They're going to put you out of synagogues, he says. So why was that such a big threat? Well, the synagogue was, was the center of all social and economic life for the Jew in, in the first century. Um, it is, of course, where the Torah was read. Um, it's if you wanted a job, uh, the synagogue is where you found your job. The job listings were there, I suppose. All legal activity was funneled through the synagogues, um, whether that be marriage, purchase of property, lawsuits, all of that happened in the synagogue. So if you're excommunicated from the synagogue, you can really see how a lot of things like this would start racking up pretty quick. So what is Jesus doing then with the Sermon on the Mount? The Sermon on the Mount, and certainly here in the Beatitudes section. My little face up here. <clears throat> the Sermon on the Mount is a warning. Jesus is warning um, his followers of what faithfulness may lead to. 
could lead to the things in this list. Um, and I think that this is, this is best illustrated um, through uh, a fun little timeline. So I think we can, here, here we are, look at this timeline. Here we go. So here's Jesus' second coming, or excuse me, his first coming. And here is Jesus' second coming. In between Jesus' two comings, this is, this is the, the church age. And, and before the church, um, <clears throat> God interacted with his people through the nation of Israel. And then after Jesus' second coming, well, that's when he's going to come and bring his kingdom with him. But what Jesus is saying here on the Sermon on the Mount is in between the comings of Christ, we are living in an age in which we can expect these things. This is a carry your cross age right here. Um, in Luke 14, it says that you have to count the cost of becoming a disciple. This often is going to be that cost. You think as well about uh, Luke 5, just before the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says that um, he's explaining to the Pharisees why his disciples do not fast. And he says, why would they fast? The bridegroom is here. We're living right here. We're living in the, the king is here time. But when the, when the bridegroom is taken away, when he's crucified, and then when he ascends to the father's right hand, well, then the disciples will fast. So we're living in the, in the bridegroom taken away age. So the Sermon on the Mount is a warning, but... It's also a promise. It's also a wonderful promise. Um, <clears throat> let me draw a little dashed line here. What does it say in the, in the, the, the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount? Well, what will happen for, you know, right now, there, there's, a, there's a temporal emphasis in the present of, of hunger. What will happen in the future? Those who are hungry now, they will be satisfied. Those who weep now, they will laugh. Hungry will be satisfied. The, those who weep in the coming kingdom will laugh. Those who are persecuted now will be vindicated. <laughs> it's hard to spell when you're on camera. Okay. Those who are persecuted now will be vindicated. So what... What Jesus is promising here in the Beatitudes, in the Sermon on the Mount, it, it's really the answer to this question. What's the best space to write this? Are you living for this world? Or are you living for the next? It's supposed to be a question mark. Are you living for this world or are you living for the next world? Now, there are plenty of examples, even within the Sermon on the Mount, of a group of people who are living for this world. Now, who do you think that, um, that group of people is? We've got to return to our, our whole pointing illustration. Who's Jesus pointing at? People living for, for, for these blessings right here. It's the Pharisees. Take a look at, at Matthew 6. <clears throat> this is how the Pharisees exercise spiritual disciplines. Um, when they give to the needy, how do they give to the needy? They sound a trumpet before them in order that they may be praised by others. And this praise, that is the only reward they're ever going to receive. It's a reward that's limited to this world. There will be no reward for them in the next. And the same thing is true in, in, in two more cases. When they pray, they um, desire to be seen by others so they can receive their reward. And that's the only reward they're going to receive. Same is true in this last example. Take a look at this with fasting. How did the, the Pharisees fast? What's their fasting like? Well, they disfigure their faces for what purpose? That their fasting may be seen by others. That's the reward they're seeking. They're seeking a reward here in this world. Uh, the, the, the popularity, the, the praise, the glory that comes from man. How then do we seek to live um, according to the next world? How do we live for the next world? Now, there's this great, great quote that I 
came across this week, and I, I want to share it with you, kind of in answer to that question. <clears throat> by a guy named William Bartley. T -t Take a look at this. What Jesus is saying is this. If you set your heart and bend your whole energies to obtain the things which the world values, that's things here in this list, if you seek to attain the things the world values, you will get them, like the Pharisees did, but that is all you will ever get. But if, on the other hand, you set your heart and bend all your energies to be utterly loyal to God and true to Christ, you will run into all kinds of trouble. See this list? This is all kinds of trouble. You may, by the world standards, look unhappy, but much of your payment is still to come, and it will be joy eternal. It will be joy eternal. For the joy that was ahead of him, Jesus endured the cross. And we're called to carry our own cross, too. Now, if we're honest, I mean, honestly, for me, I, I look at a column like this, and there's, there's a disconnect, you know? I don't, I don't know if you feel this, where, you know, this, this column would make a whole lot more sense maybe 60 years ago in, in communist China or or some other place where believers are regularly arrested, they're, they're tortured, pastors are, are murdered, churches are burned down. Um, that kind of thing is happening in many places in the world today. And in those contexts, a list like this that Jesus has compiled, that makes a whole lot more sense than in, in kind of the comfortable Christianity that, that we live in today. So how would I respond to this? I, 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 would, I would respond cautiously in, in a couple different ways. And, and, and firstly, I, I would take us to 2 Timothy 3. And this is, this is sobering. Um, take a look at 2 Timothy 3.12. Indeed, Paul promises to Timothy, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Everyone who desires to live a godly life, the promise is they will be persecuted. Now, persecution may take different forms, but the persecution is, is promised. So what, what might it look like today? Well, I mean, the gospel message that we've come to believe and which we desire to share with others, the gospel message by its nature is confrontational. I mean, in the same way that Jesus's message in his day was confrontational against the, the false messages of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that was confrontational. The gospel message that we are called to share is confrontational too, especially in today's culture in which, you know, it's, it's so pluralistic. It says that everyone is right, that no one is wrong, but, but the truth is that there is only one God and that there is one Savior. And if you refuse to accept his substitutionary sacrifice on your behalf, the truth is that, that God's revealed in his scripture, you're going to spend eternity in hell. And we are surrounded every single day with thousands of people who are headed towards that destruction. And we have the good news that there is, that there's a way of escape. Christ has died on the cross for our behalf that we may spend eternity with him, the king, in his kingdom. We have that message. And frankly, I don't know if we can possibly live a godly life in Christ Jesus um, our whole life through without sharing that message to those around us. So that, that, that's a sobering response to the potential dissonance we feel with this, with this column, but I think it needs to be said. And secondly, I would say that, you know, it, in our, if our Christian faith hasn't led to poverty and it hasn't led to persecution, that's great. Awesome. It's time then to redouble our efforts to study apologetics, to, to learn how to share our faith more effectively, to put more of, more of God's money, the, the resources that he has given us, to put more of that to work for God's kingdom purposes. Um, and, you know, in so doing, we, we learn and we practice to live more for the next world instead of, instead of for this world. All right, guys, thank you so much for, for, for joining me. Let, let me pray. Lord, I want to be storing up treasures in heaven and, and, and not on earth. It's so easy to just be stockpiling 
treasures here on this earth. Show us what it means and give us the opportunities to um, exchange these earthly things for heavenly. Um, teach us what it means to seek first your kingdom, your coming kingdom, and not our own petty kingdoms. Lord, you told us to set our minds on things that are above and not on things that are on earth. And, you know, and you've given us the, the spirit of God that resides inside of us that we may be able to um, look above in that way. Thank you so much for your patience with us and for this high calling that, that you've given us. Give us the strength to endure persecution if that is your will for us and um, utmost uh, give us a desire to know you and to um, share that knowledge of you with others. Lord, we bring these things up in your name. Amen.